Dr. Sid Jacobson is a clinical psychologist, NLP trainer, and the author of several books on NLP, including the three-volume Medication, which is the classic tome on using NLP in education. His book, Teaching Learning, Helping Your Kids Gain the Learning Skills They Won't Get Taught in School, is soon to be released in a video format. Sid has been around NLP since the beginning, and I'm excited to ask him about some of his early experiences, plus how it all applies to coaching now. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Well, Sid Jacobson, I finally get to meet you. What a pleasure it is to to meet you face to face. And for me as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Great to be here. So we have a lot in common. Uh, um, We both um, are white American men. Uh, We both speak English. Um, Both know how to use Zoom. I mean, the list goes on and on. (laughs) (laughs) It's just uncanny. (laughs) <laughs> it's like looking into a mirror. <laughs> yeah. and, and yet, and yet we have never met. Um, it's strange. But also, also another thing we have in common is uh, NLP, because I've been doing NLP longer than anybody I know. Well, not true, but pretty close. Except for you, said Jacobson. You, you just take the cake. You've been around longer than anybody, except probably Bandler and Grinder. You were, is it true you were at the second NLP training? That That's correct? right. Second NLP training. The first one was in Hawaii, I believe in late 1977. Right. The second one was in New Orleans in uh, May of 78. And that's the one that I attended. Yeah. Wow. Uh, interest, interesting aside, for those people who know NLP, um, who will know Steve Andreas, the late, great Steve sure. Andreas. Yeah. Steve at the time was still known as John O. Stevens which is his yeah. actual name. Right. And he and I actually had our tape recorders on the chair in between us for part of that training uh, for, for several different things. The training was only six days long then, but, uh, but he was recording and I was recording, but his recordings turned into some very famous books. Actually, I know that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's, what's funny was when I was reading transformations, which was one of the original books, of Bandler and Grinder in, in workshop material, yeah. I, I said, you know, this this looks really familiar. And I pulled out one of my tapes and I said, oh, yeah, this is I was there. So, wow. yeah, I've been doing this since 1978. That was actually my second NLP workshop. I'd had another one uh, earlier that year in February with a fellow named Greg Brodsky, oh. who lives in Santa Cruz, who is friends with Bandler and Grinder and and came to New Orleans and did a two day workshop. Uh, that was just mind blowing. He's a brilliant guy. I wish he was still sort of in the NLP community, but he's he's went off to do to do management consulting and stuff. Uh, just an amazing, brilliant guy, and just blew my mind. And I'll tell you, this is something you might appreciate too. And for anybody who's a therapist, you might appreciate this. When Baylor Grinder started, one of the things that they did was they went to some Gestalt therapy institutes mm-hmm. because, of course, a lot of NLP came from from Gestalt, and that's that's where I ran into them was at the Gestalt Institute of New Orleans, uh-huh. and it was very interesting because I had noticed something about Gestalt therapy in my training. I had had a year of Gestalt training when I was in grad school in uh, studying for my MSW. I have an MSW and a PhD in psychology uh, Uh separately. And when I was getting my MSW, our field supervisor uh, in a community mental health center in the French Quarter, which was an amazing place to work, uh, was a a gestalt therapist of sorts. He was, you know, budding anyway. He was trying to be one. He'd been a social worker for 25 years, but he was really wanting to know gestalt really well. And he he had basically tried transcribed his entire gestalt training that had gone for about a year and he just repeated it back to us and we had a gestalt group that we did intensively and there were just seven of us in on that team and the interesting thing i noticed was 
that it was something I took to right away. I'd had a couple of years working in psych hospitals before that. Uh, I worked on an adult acute unit, which means locked ward uh, mm-hmm. for a few months. And then I spent a year and a half with what they call borderline adolescents. Uh, so the adolescents that are just extremely difficult and challenging to work with uh, in many different ways. And, and I learned little bits and pieces of how to do a lot of things there before I actually went to grad school to be, you know, formally trained, so to speak, as a therapist. And, and Gestalt was something that I was obviously became very interested in because we could do it really powerfully and, and get a lot of really great results. But the thing that I noticed was that we were all being trained together. There were seven people and we were all smart and we were taking all the same classes. And I and a couple of the other folks seemed to get it. And a couple of the other folks just didn't seem to get it. Mm. We would be doing pieces of work and I would see something that I would want people to be doing and they weren't doing it. And it wasn't because they weren't trying. They were just seeing or hearing something different than what I was. Hmm. And when I went into Gestalt training, that the, the very first Gestalt training I had was with Greg Brodsky. It ended up being an NLP workshop. And he started off by saying something fascinating. He said, you've probably noticed that sometimes your Gestalt work works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes some people seem to take to this stuff and other people don't. And it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence or background or willingness or, or having their heart in the right place. There's something else going on. And I'm going to show you what it is. I'm going to show you how to make all your gestalt work work mm. and be effective. And I went, whoa, <laughs> this is going to be really cool. And then... He did it. <laughs> he what? showed us some amazing things just about some of the basics of NLP, a little bit about rapport skills and a whole lot about anchoring and a little bit about reframing and some other things. And he packaged it in a way that was astonishing. And it made so much sense to me because it was the first time in all of my training where somebody was actually going back to what I'd learned in as an undergrad in psychology and, and a couple of the graduate courses that I had in psychology as well and matched it with actual therapy techniques because they seemed like they were from two different worlds. Hmm. You know, I, I if, if your background is like mine, but, but anybody who's had basic psychology courses in college probably has had this particular experience. You walk in and you say, this is going to be so cool. I'm going to learn about how people think and learn and all this stuff. And they start talking about rats and statistics <laughs> and birds and chickens and monkeys. And, ch- and and the whole time I was an undergraduate, I was going, you know, do we ever get to talk about, you know, people? Do they ever come up in the conversation at all? And it was sort of like, yeah, we'll get to those eventually, but they're not important. What's really important is why this rat doesn't move when you hold it down in a certain way. And I'm like, I, yeah, yeah. And people would ask me when I got out of college, you know, what do you do with your undergrad degree in psychology? And I said, that's great. It, it's an easy answer. If you have a rat with a behavioral disorder, I'm your man, <laughs> you know, just give me a call. I know just what to do. I, I, we had even done, uh, when I was in, in the graduate courses, we were putting electrodes in rat brains and getting them to, you know, do things with reward and punishment and, uh, you know, but completely irrelevant. However, there were a lot of things from learning theory that were really applicable. And the whole idea of anchoring really goes back to state dependent learning mm. and goes back to how does somebody's state get them to be able to do something or not be able to do something or be able to remember something or not remember something. And that was the basis that we were taught, you know, in in my NLP practitioner training program and and the things Greg taught us in that first one uh, that that just lit me up because the the training itself was amazing. That, That practitioner training started like this. We're in the Hilton Hotel right on the river in downtown New Orleans, right on the Mississippi River. 
And there were 140 of us. And we all got into this big room and there was a stage up there. And one of my friends introduced me to Richard Bandler beforehand because Richard and John had been down to, to the Gestalt Institute before doing some training. And, you know, I got to meet him. Hi, how are you? That kind of thing. And then it was time to start. And Richard Bandler and Leslie Cameron Bandler, his wife at the time, John Grinder and Judy Delosier, John's wife at the time, walked forward to the front of the stage and all four of them began to speak simultaneously. Hmm. For the next 15 minutes, we had what you could only call a quadruple hypnotic induction. There wasn't any other way to talk about it. All four of them were speaking simultaneously. You couldn't track and you were trying to pick up and... I didn't know what a double induction was, much less a quadruple induction. But 140 people went into trance. I think some of them are still in trance somewhere. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but it was a very powerful experience. And then we spent the next six days doing a variety of things. It was different than training now. They actually broke us up into separate groups. They had sort of a beginner's group and an intermediate group. And then Richard actually took 25 people off who had been studying with them for a while and we never saw them again. They just, they disappeared to some other part of the hotel and the rest of us were in this giant ballroom and there was a stage at the end and then a stage on each side and, and Judy would be on one stage and Leslie would be on another and John would be on the third one. And, and they would do topics and just talk about things. Judy taught, taught uh, how to do metaphor. You know, I still have that tape too. Sure. And, and Leslie talked about families and John, John spent about three days with us just doing strategies, wow. which was amazing, which is really intense, really amazing. And then John and Richard each did a whole piece on hypnosis. Uh, John did a whole thing on inductions and Richard did a whole thing on utilization patterns. So we were getting a whole bunch of stuff just crammed in real fast. And there were no handouts. <laughs> you know, we could took whatever notes we wanted to, but it was all listen to these guys talk. Uh, John and Richard being two of the most auditory people on the face of the earth, they just wanted to talk to us and use the language skills. And and it was an amazing experience. And, and it changed me in a bunch of ways. And from there, I actually, uh, I had been working in prisons for about four months. And from there, I went into working in a family service agency where I worked for about a year and a half. And then I just went out on my own. And I was doing NLP trainings within a couple of years. Richard made me a trainer and and uh, and uh, had me come out in 1980, I guess, because he'd become friends with people in New Orleans. So he would come and visit sometimes. So so I knew Richard socially as well as I knew him on stage. And, and he he personally invited me to come to Santa Cruz. He says, I want to make you a trainer. And there were two other people in that, that group. I think there were 60 of us. And it was a combination master practitioner and trainer training. And uh, he made three of us trainers out of that group. And uh, one of those people disappeared right afterwards. We never saw her again. <laughs> and the other one um, became a trainer as well. And so uh, that's uh, what, 1980, I guess. Who, who was the one maybe. Who was the person the that was uh, Linda Summers? Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you, ever, you remember Linda. Sure. sure. Uh, yeah. She was the other person in that group. We, we got fairly close to and her. Her husband at the time, Joe Yeager. Yeah. Uh, was was doing a lot of work in the area. I have and, a book uh, I think he wrote called um, Thinking About Thinking. I think it sure was. It yeah. sure was. Yeah. Very interesting book. Yeah. He's an interesting guy. They were both very interesting people. Uh, mm -hmm. Linda was a, one of those very powerful, charismatic kinds of people. And and. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a fun, very strange, interesting training, and and uh, and then Richard would come down to New Orleans to do other things as well. I hired him to come down do part of a practitioner training once, and and part of a master practitioner training where he did hypnosis for a couple of days, and we did some interesting things. And and the other people that were bringing him in as well, uh, he did some amazing things. You may, you may not know this. There was a book that got written but never published. And I, and I noticed that you do a lot of work with sleight of mouth. Mm -hmm. And when Richard and Robert were talking about that before Robert had actually, you know, codified the, the patterns completely, I guess. And he was mm -hmm. showing them to Richard and, and they were talking about all that stuff that came from a, an idea Richard had that he called sleight of mind. 
Mm -hmm. And that came from doing card tricks. So Richard had this friend named Patrick Selinger. And Patrick was a close-up magician, meaning he was the guy who in a nightclub would come right to your table sure, yeah, and do card up. tricks right in front of you. And you could right put six nose, people, yeah. yeah, and you have put six people around him above, standing on chairs, looking around, trying to catch the trick, and of course, you know, yeah. forget it. That yeah. wasn't gonna happen. But but he was explaining how all this works. So he became a uh, part of a couple of these workshops that we did. And Patrick was, was explaining that this whole idea of slights, most people don't know where the word comes from, but a slight is a maneuver with the hand to do some trick. Okay. And there's apparently 26 of them. Oh, and every, every card trick is a combination of those different slights. Oh, wow. No, you're, it's a, <laughs> you're blowing my mind. I did, I did not know that. I didn't know it either until he told us about that. And what he did was he got together and he and Richard tried to figure out what happens to somebody inside their head when they see one of those. Because every one of them, you know, you think something's going to happen and then something different happens, basically. Mm -hmm. So how does the magician lead your thinking in a certain path and then interrupt it? So it's a whole bunch of strategies with pattern interruptions. And that's what a card trick is. <laughs> and it, when done well, it's not about just the skill with the hands. It's about what happens to the person watching. And Richard and Patrick spent time trying to codify this. They tried to make it into a system where they could literally have someone who needed to change something and show them a card trick that would do it, <laughs> literally. And they even wrote the book. They took photographs of all the card tricks. They had a, they had a, you know, a green felt like a, like a, um, a pool table. Uh -huh. And they did all these, this high, you know, high quality lighting photography and stuff with Patrick going through all the motions with all the cards and stuff. And they, they even had the woman who um, did the cartoons for my first book did the cover for their book, but they never released it. And I, I don't actually know why. I, I don't, I'll have to ask, ask somebody sometime. Next time I see Richard Bandler, I'll ask him why they didn't. But it was an interesting an interesting process. Those are the kinds of things we were doing back then. Wow. So that was and, 77 through 78, through, 9, Through 10, the early 80s, let's 11, say. Through, yeah, oh. 11, yeah, 70, 11, <laughs> right in there somewhere. <laughs> and that's 7, 11. It's Probably all the way years. up to 70, 13, maybe. <laughs> um, and there were, there were a lot of those things that we were doing back then that were just fun. And there were things with language that were fun. And, and it was just, it was great stuff. And, and, you know, later on, people besides therapy, they got into doing what they were calling coaching. Okay. And I remember, I remember John Grinder mentioning the whole idea of coaching, business coaching and things like that back then in 1978. Really? You know? Yeah. And I heard, you know, people talking about Thomas Leonard later on and, you know, some of the other people. One of my dear friends in Baton Rouge, a woman named Cammie Miller, she's mm -hmm. one of my best friends and, and used to assist me on all my master practitioner programs and stuff. And uh, she was involved in Coach U, you know, Coach yeah. University. Yeah. She was one of the people who helped design the curriculum for that. Okay. And so she had all that history and stuff too. So she would tell me about, you know, what they were doing in the coaching world and how they were trying to get people to organize uh, with the forms and the interviewing and, and the things to, to be very systematic mm -hmm. in getting people's outcomes, developing goals, and then moving people toward those. And of course, you know, NLP was a perfect part of that. Um, you know, many coaches studied NLP even at the yeah. very beginning of coaching. They just didn't talk about it very much. Right. You know, it's interesting. Thank you for that. That's a really, I mean, gosh, you're, and thank you for being such a great <laughs> interview subject. I basically go, hello. And, yeah. Yes, I seem and, to have that effect on people. I don't know what it is. And the rest, it's it's yeah. the can't shut up syndrome, I think is what they call that. <laughs> but, but it's great. Amazing information. And um, yeah, Thomas Leonard, I learned coaching from him. I, I was I was presenting at some conference back in like 1993 or something. And um, <clears throat> I was one of the bunch of presenters for, it was for business um, 
Paul Krasick, I think, was the person that brought it on. Anyway, Thomas Leonard was another presenter. I didn't know him. I listened to his presentation about coaching. I thought, that sounds interesting, but I didn't really get to meet him. I just was in the room when he talked, and I was talking about something having to do with NLP. I honestly don't remember. But um, I decided to sign up for his stuff. It sounded weird. I'd, nobody was talking about coaching. And, and my, I mean, Tony Robbins mentioned the word. And he said, I'm really more of a coach than I am a therapist. But we did NLP okay. therapies. You know, we, right. we called them right. therapies. Right. But Thomas Leonard was the first guy who I know of codified a thing he called coaching. And so I, I said, I'll find out what this is. So I took the training from him. It was all done on the telephone. But wow. it's, um, it's really interesting yeah. to me here, you know, that, that connection. Because this, you might remember, is called the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Oh, and- yeah, that. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> One of the questions I like to ask people is what do you think is an essential coaching skills or, or, you know, what are some essential coaching skills? What do you think is a skill that is essential to coaching that if you can't do it, you can't do coaching? Well, uh, there's several and here's, here's how I think about it. Uh, you know, partly from my NLP background, and partly from just my experience working with people for, for a long time. Uh, obviously, rapport skills are important. I, I think if you can't establish rapport, you can't get inside people's heads. Okay, so let's and, just stop there for a quick second. So there may be a viewer or listener or two that doesn't know what you mean by rapport skills. What, what is sure. it? Sure, and, and so let me talk about this in general. Okay. It. Let me start with a story. Okay. okay? Because this is the way that I, I introduce Can I just stop you? No stories. Sure. No stories. Okay. No stories. Stories. <laughs> stories are, they're bad. They're, stories stories are, bad. are bad. No. Bad. Bad people tell stories. <laughs> really. Which reminds me of a story. So <laughs> Richard told, told me this story years ago. And then later they put it in, in a book. I think it was one of his books on sales or something. He was having a conversation with Virginia Satir one day. And he posed her this question that had always bugged him. He said, Virginia, we're counselors. Our job is to help people. But a lot of people that come to us have gotten themselves in so much trouble by the time they get to us that they're literally in life-threatening situations. Now, this could be a battered woman. It's could be somebody, woman or man, working in a dangerous work situation. You know, I, I live in New Orleans, so I'm right right along the Mississippi River here. Most people don't know between New Orleans and Baton Rouge, which is about 60 or 65 miles of Mississippi River, is 20% of all oil and chemical production in the entire United States. Oh, my. Oh, so there's a lot of heavy industry here. Mm. And most of those plants run pretty well, but some of them are not. I used to visit a lot of those places and talk to the trainers and stuff. And uh, the ones that aren't are dangerous. And in an oil or chemical plant, when things go bad, they go bad real fast, real bad. Uh, I remember one time uh, I was lying in bed one morning and something bounced me almost out of my bed. The whole house shook and there was a smash on the windows. They didn't break, fortunately. And I went, what was that? Well, it was what's called a cat cracker, which is a catalytic cracker. It's the thing that makes oil into gasoline, basically. And it had blown up 30 miles away. Oh, my. And shook my entire house. So that's the oh, kind of oh. stuff that goes wrong in those places when somebody does something wrong. So so this is the, the question Richard's asking. He says, Virginia, there are people that are in these life-threatening situations. If they don't make a change, they literally could die. I don't understand why their normal, natural instinct to survive doesn't kick in and save them? Why is it they come to therapy and it's hard for us to get them to change? Mm, mm. This is what's, what's going on here. Isn't survival the strongest drive inside human beings? And Virginia Satir's answer was no. The strongest drive in human beings is to do what's familiar over and over and over again. Sometimes up to the point that it kills us. 
And, and that struck me when Richard told me about that, because I thought, well, this is really amazing because I've known, I've worked with people like that. I've worked with people who work in these plants and you can't get them to, they could leave the plant they're working in that's dangerous, literally go down the street and get the same job in another plant that's run well. But the answers you get from them are things like, I know how this place works. I understand it. And because I understand it, I believe I can keep myself safe. My, my understanding, my knowledge is my power. That's my safety. And because of that, I feel comfortable I can stay. Battered women that I worked with, not to say there aren't battered men, but I had experiences with battered women uh, as a social worker, would say, I don't need to leave the relationship because I understand how he works. My knowledge is my power. <laughs> I feel safe. That's making me feel, it makes me feel comfortable enough to stay in the relationship. They tell you the exact same words. <laughs> People get into these situations where what the, the, the situation they're in is their comfort, even though it's a dangerous situation. It's what's familiar. It's what they know. It's probably the reason that so many people who grow up in, in very abusive homes feel comfortable around abusers. They attract them. So how does that fit in with rapport? So the familiarity, there, there's two pieces of this that are essential for coaching, I think, for people to understand. The first part is if somebody's going to make a change, they have to leave that familiar territory. And the opposite of familiarity is cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. When somebody leaves their comfort zone, there's going to be some awkwardness, some strangeness, some challenge, some perceived sense of danger. I believe this is a genetically wired in process in human beings to keep us safe. So going, venturing out too far from what's known we have a natural internal reaction that says, whoa, don't go there. It could be dangerous, right? There could be lions there. There could be mm. tigers. I mean, that's, I believe that's where it is. And so the first thing that we have to understand is for somebody to make a change, they have to leave that territory because that's one of the things that holds things in place. So if we're talking about coaching, we're talking about change necessarily. The other side of that same discussion is, what is rapport? What is the relationship that we have to have? What's the, the coaching relationship or the therapeutic relationship? It's familiarity. We're creating that sense of safety with us in that other person. That's how I think about rapport. There's a whole bunch of skills and techniques, and we could certainly talk about that. But bottom line is, you want the person that you're working with to feel like your family, which is where the word familiar comes from. Hmm. That's the connection. We want them to feel so safe and trusting with us that they are willing to leave their comfort zone because we're going with them. That's the way that I think about it. And how do we create that familiarity? We show people that we're the same as they are. When we are around people who are like us, we feel like, true or not true, but we feel like we know them, we understand them. We have that sense of safety, that sense of comfort. The same thing that we're trying to get people out of in those dangerous situations, we're trying to create for them with us so that we can use that relationship, at least partly, to help move them to a new place. So. There's the rapport part, I think is important, being able to create a relationship where you are that person's safety maybe for a while. Mm -hmm. Secondly, understanding how people change, which means also understanding what holds things in place. Years ago, uh, training at NLP University in Santa Cruz, which I've been doing since the early 80s, uh, there's a, a British... NLP trainer named Ian McDermott. I don't know if you've ever run into Ian. It's been I've around never a long met time. him, but I know, yeah, I know he is. He's a good, good friend. And Ian did this interesting exercise, which I've kind of co-opted and changed it a little bit, but I do essentially what he did. And it's all about what holds things in place for people. 
So instead of exploring how they need to change, let's first explore how come they can't change. Hmm. What's keeping them stuck? What is stuck? What does it mean for somebody to be stuck? Well, they have to be saying something to themselves about the way that they are that keeps that stable. And a lot of times when people come up with is all the reasons why, <clears throat> excuse me, they can't do what they know they need to do or what you think they need to do or what everybody in their life has told them they need to do. And they go, well, I can't do that because, and they give you, of course, all this intellectual stuff. Mm -hmm. But that stuff's real for them. And what ends up happening is if you turn that around and you ask people, well, let me help you stay the same. And they go, what? I say, no, let's find out all the reasons why you should just stay this way. Let's forget about why you should change. Let's just focus on why you ought to stay the same. And you spend a few minutes with people, you get some really, really interesting answers that tell you a whole lot about how their beliefs are structured, mm -hmm about how they feel inside about themselves, how they are on even the identity level, who they are as a person. And they come up with stuff that's really interesting. Now, when I saw Ian do this exercise the first time, it was interesting because he said to the person he was doing it with, it was a demonstration. He said, I'm going to be the advocate for the status quo. I'm going to help you stay the same and not change. And to do that, I want to help you explore all the deeper reaches of your insides to find out all the reasons why you should stay the same that you are now. And it's funny. This is a very typical response because I've done this exercise hundreds of times since then. The person will give you for three or four minutes, they'll come up with all kinds of easy answers. I give you an example. Somebody says, I need to lose weight. I say, OK, well, why should you stay the same? And say, well, you know, I really don't like to exercise. And Ian or I doing this would say, you know, you're right. Exercise is hard. You should probably just not do that. <laughs> so being the advocate for the status quo, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. well, why else? And they say, well, you know, if I change, I'm going to have to buy new clothes. And that's really, it's time consuming and expensive. You know, all my other clothes. And you go, oh, well, money's oh, yeah, expensive. You save true. that, yeah. you know. No, yeah. we don't want to. Yeah. yeah. Totally, so yeah. you come up with all of these. I'll have to get up earlier in the morning. I'll oh, you can't do that. That's true. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So all the reasons why they should stay the same. And these are kind of, and it's fun. And, and everybody has a good laugh coming up with these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then there's usually a pause. Mm. And the conscious mind reasons have run out. And if you just wait a minute or so, some of the deeper reasons will come up. You know, I'll be a different person. People won't see me the same way. Mm. I'll feel differently about myself. I'll have done something my mother wasn't able to do. Mm. My dad wasn't able to do. Or... I don't know if my spouse will still feel the same way about me if I'm a different body shape or different, or if I'm doing all this stuff and they can't, what if they can't do it and I can't? Oh my goodness, we can't have that. So mm -hmm. the, the, the other things come up that will hold this in place that are much more uh, ingrained in the way that the person is than the, the obvious silly kind of fun reasons that come up at, at the beginning. But all that stuff's important. And when you start exploring that, and you watch people and you listen to them, you can see the changes. Because then when you say, okay, well, tell us the reasons why you should change. Well, then you get, well, the doctor told me I, you know, <laughs> it would be good for my heart. Or, you know, my, my wife says, oh, you'll, you know, you'll be happier. And, and you get this intellectual stuff or you get stuff that's just from the outside. Mm -hmm. It's not coming from them. It's coming from other people. That's why they should change. Or you get stuff that they don't really believe. You know, I should make this change because I'll be a better person or I'll live longer. or I'll be happier. And you look at them and you, there's no energy in what they're saying. You don't believe them. They're not congruent, as we say in NLP. Yeah. Right. They're not believable. Their words don't match what their body is saying. And so it's really interesting to explore that dichotomy, watching how people talk about the things that are really important to them staying the way they are versus what do they have to do to change? And if all, all the energy is in staying the same, well, that's what you need to deal with, right? And those are the things people are giving you that need to be changed. So it sounds to me like you've, you've 
started talking about rapport as an essential coaching skill, but you've also gone on to another essential coaching skill, which is, um, well, let's call them calibration skills to be able to watch and to be able to notice and to listen and to be able to hear what you're getting from the people and and to have the, the patience, if you will, to just sit and pay attention. Not an easy thing to learn. <laughs> that was a challenge for me because, as you can tell, sometimes I get long-winded. And sometimes <laughs> it's hard for me to shut up and just listen to the other person. But I've learned. I've trained myself. And it's interesting. I've got a client that I'm working with now who, who said to me about a week ago, he said, you know, I realize in talking to you, I need to talk about this stuff. And I said, yeah, I know you do. He said, other people have tried to help me before. They didn't let me talk. Mm. He says, but I need to. And I said, I know. That's why I'm letting you talk. Some people don't need to. Some people you can interrupt and say, no, just do this technique and they're done. And it works. That's another critical skill is to know what's right for the particular person you're working with. As you well know, probably better than I do, Milton Erickson was famous for having said, you know, everyone is as individual as their own thumbprint. And so you, you work with this person in the way that they need to be worked with. Of course. That's that's a uh, boy. That takes and, time. <laughs> and that's a, another set of skills. And, 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 you know, that's one of those sets of skills that it's hard to to analyze as yeah. well as some other ones. Right. And and how do we you know, what what do they say? How do you learn good judgment from making a whole bunch of bad oh, judgments? Bad judgment. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we learn a lot of these things the hard way and over a period of time. But but as as you do and it becomes a part of you, and you start paying attention for for the things that really matter for the other person to be able to, to give you the information you need and to be able to take whatever risks or make whatever changes or do whatever experiments, you know, Erickson would have everybody climb Squaw Peak in, in, huh. in Phoenix or, or do one thing or another. And people say, well, why do you do that? Well, you know, different reasons for different people. Yeah. But the fact that they would do it was the cool part. Yes. <laughs> the fact That's that people true. would do what he asked him to do, all yeah. the bizarre things he asked him to do, some of which were hysterical, but oh, I know. He would do it. I was I was actually talking with Betty Alice Erickson once about about that. And she said, Yeah, I was asking Daddy, why do they, she always called him Daddy? <laughs> why do these people do these things? There's a man out there weeding your garden right now. Why <laughs> Why do they do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was because, up because I asked them to. Because, right. No, it was <laughs> because I asked them to. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. I could hey, do the voice. <laughs> question for you. Did you ever um, meet or work with Dave Dobson at all? I knew Dave. Yeah, I oh, did. Yeah. I didn't get to work with him, but I did know Dave. How did you know yeah. Dave? I. I met him a couple of times. There was a very short-lived association in NLP in the mid-1980s that I can't remember what we called it. It was some sort of leadership something or other. And there were maybe a couple of hundred people in that, maybe 300 at one point. And here, here's what, one of the unpleasant things that happened. We We had an association, and in that, there were about 25 of us who were actually NLP trainers. And we tried to put together a peer review, um, I don't know what you would call it, a, a, a mechanism where we would send each other videotapes of us doing training or working with people or whatever it was, mostly doing training. And we would send it to three other trainers and they would give us feedback and stuff like that. And in the putting of that together, Dave was one of those folks in the meeting. We also had in that meeting, Leslie Cameron Bandler and Virginia Satir. It wow. was a very interesting meeting. Oh, yeah. And and it's, that's, that's the only time that I got to meet Virginia as well. I actually got to spend about 10 or 15 minutes in private having a a, a conversation with Virginia Satir that was really, really valuable for me. Just in those few minutes, she just you know gave me what I needed. Oh, so that's awesome. very powerful. And I remember Dave Dave looking at me at one point and saying, Sid, you see this, this system that they're setting up? He said, run, <laughs> save yourself, get out of here. Because he just, he didn't think it was going to go very well. And, and in some ways it did, in some ways it didn't, but that he was an interesting guy. He was, uh, he was somebody who understood, I think on a deep level, what really makes people do things or not mm-hmm. do things. And he could tell if something was safe or not safe. 
And he, he could, my experience of him was he could, in a very simple way, understand people down to the level of yes or no, mm -hmm. which was an, a, an interesting way of, of thinking about it. There was, a, um, I think it was Steve Langton that uh, I remember Grinder talking about one time. Steve Langton was one of the original NLP trainers as well. And, and I, I believe it was him. And Grinder said he went all through the, the entire writings of Sigmund Freud. He read every word that Freud ever wrote, which was too much. <laughs> but, words, yeah. but, he, but he was looking for some key things. And one of the things he found was somewhere in Freud's writings, Freud actually said, if you can just pay enough attention to the client and patient, he called them, to perceive when they are unconsciously telling you yes or no, you can just rely on that to guide you with whatever advice or interpretations you give them. Again, um, Sid <laughs> Jacobson blowing my mind here. Freud, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, you wouldn't think that, but you know the interesting thing about Freud. You know, here's something: when we talk about anything about change or understanding people, you know, modern psychoanalysts can spend three to five years with somebody, right? Freud's average was seven or eight months. Oh. He was doing stuff with people that he was never able to teach others that never came through in his writings or his teachings. So people who are using, or at least, you know, up until a few years ago, I think they're doing better now, actually. But a lot of people who are trying to do what he was doing weren't able to duplicate it because of those little tiny things that they didn't get in their training. Yeah. Like yeah. how to perceive when the person's telling you yes or no. Because, yeah, they don't. They don't talk about that. They don't, they're looking really at the, the, the content of the words rather than how they're being said. Right. And yeah. that's why when, when those of us who do hypnosis can use idiomotor signals and go directly after yes or no yeah. and, and gather that information. And see, yeah. to me. And Dobson, by the way, was, was a master, I think, at that, you know, noticing yeses and nos. That's one of his, was his big things. He taught that in the, the trainings that I did with him, how to detect you know, that yeah. person's yes and no, and then mirror it back to them so you could have that rapport with them. You know, it was... He was a also a guy you just trusted right away when you met him, too, mm. wasn't mm. he? I mean, he was for me. I just liked him and felt safe with him yeah. right away when yeah. I met him. So, also, just by the way, Freud also, I have a quote of his somewhere. I, have a, I bought this greeting card once, not to send anybody else, because it had a quote of, greeting, of Freud's on there that I thought, oh, my God, he said that? Which basically, yeah. he said on the screening card, it says, you know, for, for the smaller decisions in life, like, you know, what to have for lunch or what suit to wear or whatever tie to pick. And I use my conscious mind. I use my logical, rational mind. But for the yeah. big decisions in life, like who to marry or where to live, you know, then I trust my unconscious. Right. Isn't that great? Freud said that. Isn't that, <laughs> yeah. isn't that great? Yeah. yeah. Mr. But Adler. he wasn't. Yeah, right, Mr. Anal analysis. But, you know, Freud, it's interesting. If you look at the history of psychiatry or psych psychotherapy or whatever we want to call it, and you can go back 10,000 years if you want, but in modern times, we look to Freud as, as a pivotal moment, at least, during that time. And he was a brilliant man. He was a genius. And he did learn to do hypnosis. But he learned it at the level of skill that was available in his day. Mm-hmm. You know, he was working with the tools he had available to them. He, he, you know, enough about medicine that they had in the day. He was an internist after all. Mm -hmm. And he knew enough about psychiatry, what there was of it in those days. And he knew enough about hypnosis. So he was able to notice some things that other people weren't noticing. And I think, you know, if we want to talk about what kind of skills somebody needs as a coach, it's noticing things that the person themselves haven't noticed. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's that kind of paying attention, knowing that the question in there somewhere that I need to go dig up because I'm noticing something and I don't understand it and they don't understand it. We've got to find out what that is, you know, so all basic skills. So gosh, um, thank you for letting me um, 
listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> Babble on for a while. <laughs> yes. If you listen to it later, you might not be so happy. Maybe it didn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. I really, really have enjoyed it. And it's great to, to actually meet you. Um, we should do this again sometime if you wouldn't mind, because I feel to. like we've just Love skimmed you. the surface of what that, okay. of the depth of knowledge. And of, and of course, we've skimmed the surface of the topic. You know, that's yeah. it. And I, you know, yeah. it, it would be just as fun to interview you, I'm sure, because you have your own stories. And your I own am fascinating, experience. really. I am just... <laughs> Uh, to finish with this one story about that, I saw one night on the Dick Cavett show years ago. There's people listening to this who have no idea. He's an ancient person who had a talk show <laughs> many years ago. Yeah, right. And a thing called <laughs> and, television. And a thing, yes, yeah. where you had a tube in your... And yeah. and he had a guy named Zero Mostel on. Oh, Zero yeah. Mostel was one of the great actors. He was this big, booming kind of voice and yeah. a big guy and stuff. And Zero Mostel was kind of like a Robin Williams. He would come out on stage and the host would never get to ask him a question because he'd just already be talking. So he sat down with Cavett and started pontificating about something. And after about five minutes, he says, let's get on with it, young man. Start this interview. I'm a damned interesting fellow. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> That's great. And Cabot was almost rolling on the floor. He could hardly ask him anything. But I, you know, but but this kind of this kind of discussion, this kind of dialogue, is fun for me. So I'm I'm happy to do it. And happy to be with you anytime. So That's let me ask fun. you one one final question. If people want to find out more about Sid Jacobson and the things that you offer and trainings that you offer, how would they do that? Uh, they, for two ways, they could go to the post office and where they have the pictures on the wall. Of oh, yeah, looking, I've seen you <laughs> up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, uh, easy, easier way to do it is to just go to my website, SidJacobson.com. Easy Sid enough. SidJacobson.com. Where did you get com. that one? Which, I, I, I just came to me in a, in a dream, <laughs> I think. It was, and I asked my unconscious and it said, here's a name. Just use that one. Oh, that's and uh, <laughs> so that's one of the places they can do it. They can find me on Facebook or LinkedIn as well. Okay. Uh, and, and glad to connect with people uh, anytime. And so Sid thank is you. spelled S I D, right? Not S I D. Right. S I D J A C O B S O N. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank Easy you, enough. Sid. Thank you. It's been great, Doug. Thanks a lot. Well, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want any more information about today's show, please visit our website at www.essentialcoachingskills.com. Be sure to tune in again next week for our next episode and discover even more about the systems and the secrets that set the best apart.